Hi everyone, welcome to my video about why I think Mikula is a changeling and why I think fairies are a bigger part of Elden Ring and possibly going to be the subject of the DLC. Now this is a follow-up video to a video I did a few weeks ago about Mikula being a changeling and it's very theatrical and it's got nice imagery and it's pretty to look at and it's got nice music but this video is kind of unhinged and <laughs> a little disorganized if you can't tell what's on screen. I had to do this video for three reasons. One, I have a sponsorship that is expiring soon and I need to put it on a video. Two, my last video on Mikula got a lot of really good feedback and comments and insight and I also posted it on Reddit and people gave me some good ideas about that too. And three, I wanted to test out this new mic, so let me know how it sounds. Hopefully, hopefully it's good and there's no plosives and puzz and bees and whatever. Okay, so I'm just going to start this. It's going to be kind of informal. I'm going to take you through what I've been thinking this process is like. Okay, so yes, the subject of this video is I think that Mikula is a changeling. I want to go ahead and start with the reason I came up with this idea is because I recently beat Deracine, which is from Soft's 2018 VR game, and I loved that game. I it was so cute and sweet and very unlike the other Souls games out there. But when I saw the cover image for Deracine, I saw this lily right here, and my mind was immediately drawn to Mikla's lily because this is like one of the things that is a part of the game. It was his favorite lily. We'll get into the lily later. But this got me thinking, oh, okay, I wonder if there's some connection to Deracine and Elden Ring. And the more I looked into this, the more I thought, okay, I think this might be, there might be something here. All right, so Deracine is all about fairies and you play as a fairy and you help these kids and you are a fairy. Okay, that's pretty much the game. As I started to read more into the background of why Miyazaki wanted to put fairies in Deracine and where he was drawing his inspiration from, I found out that he was inspired by this Scottish writer, William Sharp, and he was a poet who wrote a lot of Celtic spiritualist and fairy poetry and fairy stories and short stories. One of his stories was actually the favorite story of Lovecraft. He said it was like his favorite short story called The Sin Eater. William Sharp had a dual identity in which he also pub published works under the name Fiona McLeod. And I thought that was really interesting because we all know, of course, Mikola also has a dual identity as St. Trina and it's a female dual, dual identity. So I thought maybe, hmm, that could be the whole Mikla St. Trina thing might be a callback to William Sharp. And I know that we have the whole thing with America and Radigan as well, but Miyazaki loves to intertwine uh, references and inspirations from other sources. So I'm not sure if anyone else has thought of this yet, but I thought that was pretty interesting, the connection between William and Fiona and Mikla and St. Trina. So that's one thing. Number two, the fairies in this game, sorry, I don't know how to use this program. This is on Canva. It's called a mind map, by the way. I never knew the name of this thing where you have like an image and you have red string is called a mind map, but yeah, that's what it's called. So in the game, the fairies have this blue sparkly haze that covers their eyes. And I thought, oh my gosh, that looks so much like the same kind of blue sparkly haze that you use when you summon Torrent or you summon the spirits. And so I thought, oh, maybe that's uh, another connection there. Okay, I'm going to make a lot of connections. So <laughs> I'm. there might be a little going off the deep end here, but whatever, we'll go with it. Also, okay, this is another big one. The evil fairy in Deracine that you see. I think looks so much like Mikola when, so this is, I found this image on Reddit and this is Mikola's image or his model in the game. And compared to Melania, you see like he's huge. Look at the similarities between the evil fairy and Mikola inside the cocoon, okay? They look the same to me. And now I'm thinking, 
oh, what if all those giant bodies in Shifa River and Ansel River are fairies? Because we'll get to those rivers in a minute. But, I mean, come on, they do look similar, right? So, yeah, those are my, those are my connections to Derecine and it being about fairies. Now, Derecine is a French term that means to be uprooted or displaced from one's environment, which is what very literally happens to Mikola as Moog uproots him and takes him out of the Halig tree. Uh, si vous parlez français, uh, le mot est déraciné. It sounds prettier like that, doesn't it? You know, speaking of French, I have something very interesting um, to share with you for a second. You may not know this about me, but in addition to gaming, one of my favorite hobbies has been learning French. Learning a language is actually a really beneficial, fun, practical skill for you to develop that you will continue to take with you throughout the remainder of your life. And it's really good exercise for your brain as well. I want to thank today's video sponsor, Babbel, the language learning app that can help you read, write, compose, converse, and listen to another language in as little as 13 days. Babbel has structured lesson plans for beginners all the way up to intermediate and beyond and has fun little learning games, podcasts to listen to, videos to watch, articles, and online classes that you can enroll in with expert teachers. I think that learning a language is the perfect hobby to pick up in addition to gaming because you can use what you've learned and practice it by listening to the different dialogue and the subtitles and the languages that you're trying to learn. So you're having fun and being educational and doing something good for yourself at the same time. To get started with Babbel, go ahead and click on the QR code on my video or the link in the video description or the comment section. All three of these will take you to my own tailor-made code for moi that will get you up to 60% off of your subscription. So go ahead and click the link, start learning a different language today, and hey, maybe one day you'll understand the phrase, uh, toucher la classe. By the way, that was my first sponsorship I've ever done, I've ever agreed to because I actually learn French, I actually use Babbel, and I've always said, I'm not gonna do sponsorships unless it's something that I actually use. So I've gotten requests from like NordVPN and what's the other one, Raid Shadow Legends. Let me tell you what, if you ever see me doing a Raid Shadow Legends <laughs> sponsorship on my channel, I will be destitute. You will know I have fallen on hard times, but for now, I can be a little bit snobby and say, no, I only want to do uh, the sponsorships en français, en Babel. Okay, anyways, so that is Derecine. Now I'm going to move over to the changeling theory and just go over this very briefly. I do go over this in my video that I did, my more theatrical video, but just laying the groundwork here. So changeling characteristics, a change, so let me back up for a second. Fairies would come and kidnap babies. They were especially drawn to like very bright, shiny babies, blonde haired babies, fair hair, and they would kidnap them. And then they would replace them with a fairy baby, a changeling. And the changeling, um, <laughs> there was always, this is such a terrifying picture, by the way, he looks dead. But yeah, so the changeling would have characteristics like they wouldn't grow correctly, they'd have polio, but they'd also be like very bright and very intelligent and very wise beyond their years, which is a perfect description for Mikola. So back to the character model of Mikola inside the cocoon. Why does he look like this? Is it because, I mean, this is a far cry. Put them side by side for so that you can see this is a far cry from this kid right here growing up. Like, why does he have this appearance? And so I think it's it just points to possibly there was some changeling shenanigans going on. And this was never, this was never Mikla right here. This is like the fairy changeling. And that's why when he dies, he turns into his true form. Because changelings were also, um, they could often be old fairies. So old fairies would take the place of a baby so that they could have the warmth and the benefit of, um, you know, a human's love. And so it wouldn't necessarily be like a fairy baby. It'd be like an old fairy. And that is exactly what this looks like to me. Now, another thing about changelings that is really poignant is they would often also be a block of wood or a log that was enchanted to look like the baby. And I think this is a callback to, oh, I think Mikola's body inside the halig tree, this wooden corpse that you see 
inside um, the room where you fight Melania. I think this is a callback to that whole idea about blocks of wood being enchanted to look like the victim, the kidnapped victim. And so when Moog kidnaps Mikola, he's not actually kidnapping Mikola, he's kidnapping the fairy changeling. And so it leaves behind a wooden corpse because that's like the one layer of the changeling kidnapping. And then that is why this guy, whoever it is, this old fairy, his true form is revealed. I also found, and I will get into this later, but... I found this image when I was doing my homework on changelings, and this is from an old Danish fairy tale. And this image right here, it's from a fairy tale about a princess who was swapped with a changeling. And I think it looks so much like this, this image, whom I'm convinced is Mikla for the DLC. Sorry, I hit the mic. And so, yeah, I thought, oh, well, maybe they used that reference. If they were researching changelings, they could have found the same reference and thought, oh, here, here we go. There's Mikla. So yeah, that is just a little backstory on changelings. Now, I know this this is so, it's all over the place. Um, let's get into the relationship, the things that I think are more proof that Mikla is a fairy or that it draws inspiration from fairies. So let's go for the butterfly wings. So these things right here 100% look like wings to me, okay? You cannot tell me that they don't. They legit are wings. Um, they could be butterfly wings, dragonfly wings, but they are wings. Okay, it's very apparent. And there is a bunch of spider web. So, wings. Okay, all right. So, butterfly wings. So, fairies have been drawn and illustrated with butterfly wings ever since the, like the late um, 1700s. There was an author, Alexander Pope, who wrote um, a play, The Rape of the Lock, and it's a satirical play. It's not like it's the stealing of a lock of hair. But the illustrator drew the fairies with wings. And then ever since then, they were associated with having wings. And that's how we all know the fairies today. And the nascent butterfly is one of the three butterflies that you can find. And this to me looks a lot like the same kind of translucent, sickly material as is on Mikola's back right here and nascent means just coming into existence which I really think is a perfect description for Mikola and also the Halig tree and it also says this butterfly appears as if it's just emerged from its cocoon for its entire life and where else do we see a cocoon but Mikola. Mikola is in a cocoon. Cocoon slash egg but that is definitely a cocoon and again it's I mean the symbolism to butterflies using cocoons to metamorphosize and why was he in a cocoon well maybe that was his mode of transportation we will get into why he was metamorphosizing later also Melania had butterflies butterfly wings that's her final form her wings were created were made up of butterflies so that is just more butterfly analogy and I will briefly talk about what I think Melania might have been too, but we'll do that later. But yeah, that is butterfly wings. Now, fairies are also associated with nature and they've been associated with nature ever since. Here we go, A Midsummer's Night Dream. So William Shakespeare wrote this play in 1595, which is crazy when you think about that. But the fairies in A Midsummer Night's Dream were very much involved with having control over nature and they were able to affect nature and here you go i think this might be puck right here this little fairy um but the fairy puck he was the mischievous one in the play and he made a sleeping potion well it wasn't a sleeping potion it was a love potion that he put on the eyes of the people who were sleeping but it was a potion made out of purple pansy flowers and purple, I have it bolded right here, we all know is associated with St. Trina. Wait a second, I'm in the wrong for, okay, okay, never mind. <laughs> I'm jumping all over the place, sorry. I will be coming back to that, but yes, that has to do with nature. You can tell <laughs> it was a little uh, chaotic making this. But yes, we'll get back to the purple, but it's just they have been associated with, oh, sleep and nature. Sleep and nature, both were in a Midsummer Night's Dream. I promise I'm not making this up. This is like, this is, a, this is a very organized 
I know why they call this a mind map because this is exactly what the inside of your mind feels like when you're trying to put something together. So do you see how much chaotic, how much more chaotic it is? Not like having a, a bullet point, like nicely organized flow chart of what I need to talk about. Okay, so nature is associated with fairies. Yes, back to the flowers. So St. Trina's lily and Nicholas lily are water lilies and they're both one and the other is associated one was with Michaela and the other is with Saint Trina and they have this text exceedingly rare to find and that is also the description of the nascent butterfly so all three of these say exceedingly rare to find which I thought hmm maybe that's a connection between all of them this is just another association Michaela has with liking nature and flowers and as far as I know and can recall off the top of my head after like so many hours in this game. I don't think any of the other demigods have such a connection to nature the way that Mikla does. This was some more reference image that I found. This is uh, Titania and Oberon, the king and queen from Midsummer Night's Dream, sleeping in lilies. And I just thought, oh, oh lilies, okay. Miyazaki's research team. I know I'm putting like a lot of faith into just assuming they came across this and used it as a reference image. Um, but this is what I think. Okay, also, sacramental blood, bud. So the sacramental bud is this one right here. This is the one that is implied to be Michelob's blood, basically an immature bud containing fresh blood. Believed to originate long ago from a strain of buds cultivated with youthful sacramental blood. And the crystal and rimmed bud, if you read their descriptions, they refer to them as a plant. So I thought, hmm, this is really interesting that Michaela's blood is considered a plant, basically, because it's in the same exact thing. So why would his blood, why would his blood become a plant? And why was his, why was his blood even feeding the halig tree? The whole idea of him putting himself in the halig tree was because he wanted to feed it and he wanted to grow it. So it doesn't grow like a regular tree, it grows with his blood. And I thought, that is a direct connection to nature right there. Now, someone in my last video pointed out that, uh, where is this? Oh yeah, okay. Elf, Elfanel, is that how you pronounce it? Because I've never actually said this and I can't remember any of the characters actually saying it. Elfanel, which by the way, if it is pronounced Elfanel, Elf, right there okay connection to fairies they said Elfinel looks like Rivendell and this is Rivendell from the fairy city Lord of the Rings and Elfinel from Elden Ring and I agree they do look really similar like even this right here I wish I had there this gazebo I'll, I'll maybe I'll get a picture of the gazebo from Elden Ring and put it up um, but yeah they do look extremely similar so, oh yeah, the, here's my comment here. Mikla was growing a new herb tree with his own blood. Direct connection to nature. When the golden order failed, nature might prevail. The original great tea tree can also be seen in Shiva River. So yes, that is another thing we'll get back to later. Is that Mikla had this idea to grow the halig tree because he thought, well, if the golden order can't cure the scarlet rot, then maybe nature can. So... Yeah, that is nature. Okay, so let's go on to fairy animals. Now, fairy animals. There is another mention of a fairy in the game besides the blue dancer charm, but we'll get to that in a second. There is this long-tailed cat talisman, a brooch depicting Lacrima, the long-tailed cat. And it really doesn't say anything else. Lacrima features in the fables of Rai Lucaria, in which he is described as a fairy cat who is fond of playing in the Great Bell Tower. So this cat right here, obviously a fairy cat. Well, not obviously because I didn't know this. Um, but fairies, so fairy animals, there's multiple types of fairy animals. And one of them is a cat she. So this is pronounced she, not Sith. I know cat Sith is in Final Fantasy and we don't call it cat Sith, but... This is cat she and cat she's were fairy cats and they were considered malevolent malevolent they would sit next to a body and they would suck its soul out and so guards would be put up to protect the cat she the fairy cats from sucking the souls out of dead bodies 
And I thought this was interesting because, and I put a dotted line if I wasn't sure if something had a direct connection. So I'm not sure if these two are connected. They don't, <laughs> I mean, the only similarity here, I guess, is that, but now that I'm looking at this face closer, like that definitely does not look like the cat she at all. I thought it was interesting how these cat statues are called burial watchdogs, but they're a cat and they're in the catacombs. So weird that they'd put a cat she statue in the catacombs, but maybe it's not a cat she, but is it related? I don't know. Maybe. Another dotted line. So lacrima means tear. And that made me think, oh, and it's a silver. It's silver. So silver, lacrima, silver tear. And where was the silver tear? Where did they live? They lived in the eternal city, which is found in, yes, Ansel River. And we'll get to the Ansel River in a second too. So dotted line, because I'm not sure, but silver, lacrima, silver tear. I thought that was a connection. And this might be a connection to fairies. If so, then because these silver tears were in Ansel River. I'm sorry. I really hope this is not like super disjointed. I'm hoping having a visual chart helps more so maybe than like following a video and not being able to know, but whatever. We'll just go with it. Okay, so moving on, fairy animals. Now, there are other fairy animals. They are called the... I'm not even going to try. I will try, but it's not going to be anywhere in the ballpark. Quanon, who were the spectral hounds of Onwin. And these were these dogs. Now they're white, they have red ears in the fables, but they would accompany different mythological hunters on these big um, wild hunts that they were called. And one of the hunters that they accompanied was a fairy king. And when I, when I saw this, oh, fairy dogs are also a thing. I thought, oh, maybe this is a reference to the wolves. And so maybe these spectral hounds are a reference to these lone wolf ashes. And there's nothing really in their description that says anything about whether or not they could be fairies. In fact, it says they encountered a nameless tarnish who welcomed this, them as hunting companions. So I wasn't sure if that nameless tarnished, who is that supposed to be? But if you go to Faramazula at the Malekith site of Grace, there is a statue of a woman and there are three dogs. So I think these two are definitely related. Now, are these Images both references to the Quan Onwin, who were these spectral hounds that accompanied different gods and mythological features on hunts. And so therefore, these are a reference to those. This is just, the reason I put this in here is because this whole section of, on fairy animals, like this is to lay the groundwork that fairies play a bigger part in Elden Ring, at least an in inspiration of the backstory, inspiration of some of the characters in the setting that we might have previously not considered. So if it seems like I'm making connections and kind of like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm just, I'm just trying to frame this in, in terms of maybe fairies did make a bigger inspiration or they did play a bigger inspiration. We just haven't really considered that yet. So there are also fairy horses and fairy cows. So fairy horses, they can be kind of mischievous, like Kelpies and shift, shift changing shifters. What's it called? Shifting change, shift shapeter, shape shifting. There we go. Shape, shape shifting. I got it. Um, so fairy cows and fairy horses are also fairy animals. And these highland cattle, this is kind of what the fairy cows, the Crotomara look like. And I saw that I thought, oh my gosh, that kind of looks like Torrent. So Torrent, I think, looks like a mixture of a highland cow and a horse. And if you look at him with his shaggy mane over his eyes and his horns and his horse body, yeah, that he does look like a mixture of a highland cow and a horse if they had a baby. And Torrent is called the spectral seed. So, I mean, spectral steed. So if Torrent is a fairy creature or a reference to fairy horses and fairy cows, this would explain why Torrent eats roa berries. So roa berries are 
very much, I mean, not only in name and appearance, they seem to be a direct reference to rowan berries. And rowan berries come from rowan trees and these trees warded off evil, they warded off witches, they warded off fairies. But I don't think they were like dangerous to fairies because there's so much illustration showing fairies, they love rowan trees, but they also don't want to be around them. So I don't really understand how that works. But yeah, looking at these, I'm like, yeah, this is, this is exactly what the roa berries are clearly supposed to be. But because rowan trees and rowan berries and the wood and everything about the tree was very important to fairy folklore and a big part of fairy stories, I thought it was just one more inclusion of fairy folklore in Elden Ring that strengthens this, this idea that fairies exist in lands between also there is a white variety of rowan berries and there's a right white variety of roa berries interesting connection there i mean it's it's obvious i don't really have to to i don't have to convince you too hard of that okay so torrent eats roa berries torrent also we went over this this uh glittery sheen earlier but a question i had is where does torrent live that it can be summoned from and returned to like what is that realm so fairies have access to the fairy realm and they also have access to the human realm but humans don't have access to go back and forth they have to be taken there by the fairies but fairies can just travel freely um between those realms so this also got me thinking torrent you summon with this this the whistle and the spirit summons you summon with the bell. And Dolores, the sleeping arrow puppet, is a spirit summons that uses Tra Saint Trina's arrows. So clearly, Dolores has some sort of access to the same realm where Saint Trina is, okay? And what I did was I, I went in game and I tested to see whether or not the animation and the same effect that you get for summoning torrent is the same for summoning a spirit summons and they looked identical they've got the same white hazy sparkle and there is a distinction so i actually also went to the ancestral spirit in shifa river and that is slightly it's not the same color as torrent's summon but torrent's summon is the same color as the spirit ash summon so this is kind of proof to me that wherever this realm is, you don't necessarily have to be dead to access it because Torrent, I think, lives in the same realm. And I think St. Trina, who was not dead, is also in that same realm. And that's how Dolores was able to use their arrows. And also, yes, the, uh, the hazy mist on the fairies in Deracine also looks like the same. So yeah, the spirit calling bell, this is what you use to spirit to summon them. And Ronnie gives that to you. And Ronnie's little figurine is found in Ansel River. And I know I keep making references to Ansel River. We will get back to Ansel River. But that is pretty much the fairy animals. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if St. Trina has the ability to go to this fairy realm and back to the land of the living, then this might explain the reference the this might explain the dlc image in which you can see all of these spectral gravestones and all of these land markers and i'm wondering if this is kind of the way that trina who i think is in this image sees the world like trina can see both realms they can see this spirit realm where all of the spirit summons live where where torrent can access and but they can also see the land of the living so yeah that is fairy animals now moving on let's go over let's go over rot yeah because this is where we talk about shifa river and ansel river so rot is obviously a huge part of the game melania is cursed with scarlet rot um the goddess of rot remembrance says that one was cursed with eternal childhood that's mikla and the other harbored rot within that's melania and Melania becomes the Scarlet Valkyrie and the Goddess Rod, and that was Melania's affliction. So, 
because of that, that sort of motivated Mugla to finding a cure for the rot. And we learn from Radigan's Rings of Lights that Mikla abandoned fundamentalism for it could do nothing to treat Melania's accursed rot. This was the beginning of unalloyed gold. So this makes me think that Mikla, the changeling Mikla, wanted to, wanted access into Mikla's position in order to put himself closer to access the Golden Order, to see if the Golden Order was strong enough to cure Melania's rot. And it was not. So Mikla starts inventing different tools to figure out how he can do this. And this is where the unalloyed gold needles and Mikla's needle are where they come from. It says, A ritual implement crafted to ward away the meddling of outer gods. It is thought capable of forestalling the incurable rotting sickness. And Mikla's needle, it also says it was crafted to ward away the meddling of outer gods and it's capable of subduing the flame of frenzy. So these were very, very, these were strong items. The fact that Mikla could make something to literally ward off an outer god is, I think that's a sign right there. So when Mikla found out, okay, the golden order is not strong enough. I need to do my own stuff. I need to return to uh, and this one I thought was really interesting because this one just looks like twigs. This one looks like this one is made out of gold and this one is made out of like twigs and wood. So yeah, another connection to nature, having the, um, having the strength to fix something or to cure something, or in this case, to prevent the meddling of outer gods. So my question now is, was the changeling Mikola, and I have Shrifra and Quote in parentheses, we'll get to Shifra in a second. Was Changeling Mikola trying to cure Melania's rot as a way to test out what would work to cure the lake of rot in Ansel River? Is Ansel trapped there? Okay, so moving on to talk about Shifra and Ansel River. Now, this is where I think, I think the biggest clues for this whole Changeling, Mikola is a Changeling fairy theory, lies in these two rivers right here. So Shifra River is where you find Mikla's cocoon. That is where Moog kidnaps Mikla and takes him to, is in the Shifra River Zone. Shifra is an Irish Gaelic name that means changeling. That is what it literally means, and that is where you find Mikla. I think that's, you can't get more clear than that. The description for both Shifra and Ansel River are two great rivers flow beneath the lands between the Shifra and the Ansel. This vast region is said to be the grave of civilizations that flourished before the Erd Tree. Civilizations that flourished before the Erd Tree might absolutely include fairies. Ansel River is a Scottish Gaelic term and it translates to self. And this came from an old fairy tale, a Northumbrian fairy tale, which is like a, I think it was like a medieval, like, 600 AD uh, civilization, Anglo-Saxon civilization or whatever. But that that fairy tale was about a little boy who is playing with a little fairy who comes to visit him. She crawls down his chimney. And as they're playing near the, the chimney, the embers sort of spark up and they burn her. And then her mother pulls her and takes her back home. And this is something that I posted when I posted this theory on the Elden Ring subreddit for more insight and like, oh, what do you guys think about this? Someone responded that they thought the fact that the little fairy girl is burnt with an ember and she's taken away was telling of Ansel River. And I thought, oh my gosh, yeah, that's that would exactly explain what happened to Melania, right? The little girl is burnt by an ember and she's taken away. I... I think here that we have the names of the two fairies involved. I think Shifra is the changeling. And I think Ansel, meaning self, is very literally the river. A river fairy. We already know that fairies have a strong connection to nature. So the fact that this would be the embodiment of the river, Ansel, meaning self, I think has, um, I think it has a lot of merit. And of course... Ansel River is where the Lake of Rot is. Now that says a great lake of standing water downstream of the Ansel River. It is said that the divine essence of an outer god is sealed away in this land. And 
as we can see when we go to the lake of rot it is very much just completely disgusting it's stagnant there is this hallway in which you go from one of the sites of grace and as you're walking down you can see it just changing before your eyes and it's so gross and it's sad because you can see the rest of Ansel River and how beautiful it is. And then you come to the Lake of Rot and you're like, yeah, this place is disgusting. It's corrupt. So the question that I have for this section on Rot is, was the changeling Mikola, Shifra, trying to cure Melania's Rot as a way to test out what would work to cure the Lake of Rot and Ansel River? And is Ansel trapped there? Is this a reference? Did Ansel get burned by the God of Rot and taken away? And all this time, Shifra has been trying to cleanse the rot through Mikla. So if, if Mikla could find out how to cure Melania's rot, kind of using Melania as a test subject, like, if I can cure Melania's rot, then I would be able to cure the Lake of Rot and Ansel River. I will be able to cleanse that rot. And that's what I think the inspiration was. So Shifra wasn't able to do it through the Golden Order and thought, well, let me just make a halig tree. Let me grow a new herb tree and see if nature is strong enough to overcome. Because you can actually see the roots or the bottom of the trunk of the great tree in, I believe, Ansel River or Shifra River. One of those. I think it's Ansel River. You can see the trunk of it down there. So clearly they had access to this original tree and and um, I think that's that's what the idea is. So right here I have an image of what I think is Shifra and an image of what I think is Ansel, possibly. And we'll get to that section right now. So the blind swordsman. This charm right here, the blue dancer charm, says that it's a cloth doll depicting a dancer garbed in blue. The dancer represents a fairy who in legend bestowed a flowing sword upon a blind swordsman. Blade in hand, the swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was wrought itself. So, we know here that this blue dancer charm, this fairy, gave a sword to a blind swordsman. And this was the whole situation. This is directly related to Shifra and Ansel Rivers, this blue dancer charm. Now, the blind swordsman, on the curved sword talisman, it says that a blind swordman, a blind swordsman was the originator of this technique, the art of one, allowing one's opponent to strike so as to leave them vulnerable to a well time well-timed reply and this made me wonder if did is this Shifra and is this Ansel and did Shifra give Ansel the weapon used I have a weapon that is strong enough to seal off rot but you're going to have to subdue it you're going to have to let the the rot strike you the art of allowing one's opponent to strike and it just the parry didn't work that's what I'm wondering. That's what I'm wondering this means. Because if so, okay, so here's the, where where is the flowing sword? Oh, here it is. Yes, the flowing curved sword. If Shifra gave this sword to Ansel as a way of subduing the god of rot and it backfired and so the god of rot got trapped there, Ansel died there, got, you know, whatever. Oh, also, sorry, <laughs> little disjointed my thoughts but okay let's just read the description of this flowing curved sword really quickly legends speak of a master of the sword garbed in blue here garbed in blue and his curved blade that was patterned after flowing water ansel river Shefer river flowing water strong attacks a leash a strong attack unleashes a series of strikes akin to a dance and that is that waterfall dance waterfowl dance that melania also does so we know that this is the same we know that Melania learned from this originator, whoever had the sword. And this sword is actually found in the consecrated snowfields next to St. Trina's torch. And we'll get to St. Trina's torch in a second. But I thought, is there any relationship to them being found in the same vicinity? The sword and the torch, the sword of the flowing cur curved. So, <laughs> so I'm like, really? This is why I need something, a guide to follow because I feel like I'm rambling, but hopefully this is, hopefully you're keeping up with it. Now the blue cloth set says that it's a set of a nomadic water warrior. The blue color of its fabric symbolizes brisk waters as fluid and flowing as the sword in the hand of its wearer. Just as still waters turn foul, stagnation leads to decay. 
And that I thought was, oh, right here, this lake of rot. The description is standing water. So this is why I think all of these items right here are connected. And now I can't unsee this theory. So I think that Shifra created this flowing curved sword and gave it to Ansel. And Ansel developed a technique that could seal away rot, but it was at the expense of trapping it there and either killing him or trapping him there with it. And so that's what happened. Um, and then we have this over here, this prosthesis where heirloom talisman says that it is engraved with a scene from a heroic tale. Though born into the accursed rot, when the young girl encountered her mentor in his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. And that made me wonder if Shifra somehow, like what is Shifra's involvement with Melania if we do think that the blue fairy was Shifra who gave the flowing sword to the blind swordsman and then like what, I don't know. And so I don't know at what point in time also this whole um, – changeling thing would have taken place because changelings they didn't just have to be kidnapped as babies actually humans could be chain kidnapped as changelings as well like full-grown humans we know that's not the case though because it seems Malika Mikla at this point was just you know this was how old he was so I don't know um and this isn't a perfect theory it's just a theory it obviously needs some there are some holes in it for sure but there are a lot of holes in Elden Ring itself, okay, that they, they, I feel like they're leaving, they're leaving the whole filling into the people playing it and having like this much time and creativity to see what they come up with. Um, but yeah, so this is why I think all of these are connected, the blind swordsman, the rot. Now, the thing that I kind of thought about that made sense to me was if Shifra, oh, we know the blue fairy gave this flowing curved sword to the blind swordsman who then sealed away Rot. So they basically had an item that was capable of resisting an outer god or defeating an outer god. And we know that Mikola has experience, has the knowledge to create a tool to ward off the meddling of outer gods. And how does Mikola know how to do that? Because Mikola had already done so with the flowing curved sword. So both of these items are able to ward off the meddling of an outer god. One strong enough to seal it away. The other one hopefully was trying to cure it. It was at least able to stall rot. And the description, um, when this is a fixed after Millicent's quest line, you pull it back out. It says that it bears no trace of befouled blood, but is faintly moist with dew. And I thought that dew was another callback to water. We see water is a big symbolism here. All the, the, the language flowing water, flowing, still waters, flowing, flowing blade, blind swordsman, water, river. So that's why I think all of these are connected. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense because when I started putting it together more, I thought, yeah, I really think that this is the case. I think that Shifra, the fairy, wanted to help Ansel get rid of the god of rot who was infecting or stood a, a chance of infecting the rest of Ansel River and it just, it backfired and therefore Shifra is like, okay, I'm going to go take Mikla's place because maybe if I get up there, I can use the golden order to my own my own will and I can cure Melania's rot as a way to test out whether or not what works. So he was kind of using Melina as a guinea pig. That's, that's, it sounds like a good theory to me. And it sounds, it sounds great. <laughs> not just because I came up with it. I think it sounds good. Okay, so moving on, another thing about fairies is that fairies have a spell called glamour. And glamour is a fairy's ability to, bewitch someone to seeing something that they want or disguising themselves to, as appearing a certain way. And the bewitching branch 
says that if you pierce a foe, it turns them into a temporary ally. The Empyrean Mikola is loved by many people. Indeed, he has learned very well how to compel such affection. Now, why would Mikola know how to do this? Because that's a glamour spell. And if you see the spell in game when you use the bewitching branch, you can see it kind of like it bewitches them. They Oh, they automatically, they go fight for you. So why would Mikola know how to do this? Because this is very much fairy magic. And... I just think it's another, this is like a really strong connection to Mikola being a fairy. Mikola, Changeling Mikola, Shifra, whatever, being a fairy. Now, moving on, our last category, I believe, yes, is St. Trina. All of St. Trina's items are associated with sleep and they're all associated with the color purple. So the arrows, the torch, and the sword of St. Trina. And what is very interesting is that all of Trina's items, even uh, the Faber's cookbook, which refers to Trina, they don't refer to St. Trina with male pronouns. They only refer to St. Trina by name or definitively the Faber's cookbook um, refers to Trina as a female who is utterly captivated for her. Okay, so female pronouns. I thought it was very interesting that Mikla's items – any item that mentioned Mikla used male pronouns, but the items that mentioned Trina either refer to Trina with she, female pronouns, or by name. And again, that could just be another callback to American Radigan, but even beyond that, I think that because Miyazaki loved William Sharp so much, here, make it easier, Miyazaki loved William Sharp so much, and William Sharp, it wasn't just a pseudonym. He had a dual identity as Fiona McLeod where he answered letters in their tone and he wrote letters as William and he wrote letters as Fiona back to William and it was just, it was like a very ahead of their time sort of way to um, operate and have different publications and um, very interesting individual. But so I think... Michael and Trina might be a reference back to William and Fiona. But yeah, back to St. Trina. So uh, fairies were also known to shoot arrows. And that is why in your sleep, if you ever had like, oh, my neck hurts, my back hurts, it's because a fairy shot you in your sleep. So just the fact that Michaela would have, or I guess I'll refer to Trina, would have arrows is kind of this, oh, Trina lives in fairy realm. It's just another connection to fairies. And Trina's torch, on the face of the torch, so this is what the face looks like. I think this looks so much like Melania, even down to the obscured eyes. Like they both have the obscured eyes. And this is just another reference to blind. But the fact that the face looks, looks so similar here, and the torch says that it depicts Trina in adult form. It got me thinking, well, maybe Mikola wasn't cursed with, not the real Mikola, was not cursed with eternal childhood. And in this realm where they were, they lived as St. Trina in this in-between fairy realm, they grew up. And that explains why the figure on the horseback over here, if this is Mikola, is not a child, but grown up. Now, my... My big idea here is that I would love if the DLC, which I think is going to feature Mikla, if this figure right here is Mikla, if the DLC was in a fairy realm or it was this realm where you haven't accessed yet but you've seen characters, all the spirit ashes, torrent, who are coming and going from it. Oh, and also, this would also explain why Mikla is on torrent or a torrent like creature this fairy cow slash highland horse no wait fairy horse slash highland cow that would also explain why Mikola has access to this fairy animal if they are in the same realm this realm right here this realm where Dolores was able to access the arrows and everything like that if the DLC took place in a fairy realm, how cool would that be? I used to think that it would take place in a dream because of all the dream analogy, all of the, the quests with Mikola and all of this, all of Tra St. Trina's items inflicting sleep. But a lot of people point out like, yeah, that was already done with Bloodborne, right? Like that, the dream, the nightmare, that was such a big part of Bloodborne already. And because Miyazaki put so much work into fairies and researching them and 
and creating his own rules and his own his own universe with fairies and what they looked like and kind of envisioning what powers they had. And because Derecine hasn't really been referenced a lot and because he likes to reference his games and other games and whatnot, I really think that the reason they cut Mikla's content was because they wanted to explore this more. And instead of doing sleep, they're like, okay, maybe let's flesh it out. Let's do fairies. And so the DLC, you're going to go to this like dark fairy realm. I mean, how cool would that be? So this is my personal pet project theory. And I, it's, I know it sounds complicated, but to me, it makes so much sense now that I can't unsee it. And I like really desperately want it to be true. So <laughs> we'll see. I'm going to use this video as proof. Like, did I get it right? Did I predict it? Because I'm, that all just, I mean, that would be kind of incredible. But anyways, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. I know it was long and somewhat rambling, but I thought it'd be fun to kind of just talk about this and some of this this theory for good so that is it that's all there is to know about fairies and mikla and elden ring and yeah all right everyone thanks so much for watching big special thank you to my channel members doomsday zen james flack twisted bishop solomon joey alexander and don Sequoy. thank you so much for your support i really appreciate it and if you would like to support me and my channel and my videos you can sign up on the membership section of my youtube channel all right everyone until next time bye